Hello, hello, I'm Erin Aid. This is Boom Bust, and these are some of the stories that we're tracking for you today. The Swiss National Bank dropped a bomb on financial markets Thursday, ditching its currency rate floor to the euro. We'll tell you what this means for Switzerland's economy, the eurozone, and the global currency markets as a whole. Then Peter Schiff, he's on the show. The CEO of Euro Pacific Capital is giving us his take on the Swiss franc drama. Then in today's big deal, Edward Harris and I are talking about, that's right, you guessed it, currency wars. You don't want to miss a moment, so let's get to it. The Swiss National Bank shocked financial markets Thursday by ditching its policy of capping the Swiss franc to the euro. The unexpected move sent the safe haven currency soaring up as much as 41% against the euro. Stocks plunged amidst fears of what this would do to Switzerland's very, very export-reliant economy. Now, the abandonment of the cap, which essentially pinned the franc to 120 to the euro, prompted a 20% collapse in the euro versus the franc. It was the biggest single-day depreciation in a major currency of all time. So big deal, guys, big deal. The Swiss National Bank also cut a key interest rate on overnight bank deposits from minus 0.25% to minus 0.75%, raising the amount that investors pay to hold Swiss deposits. The negative rates are basically designed to make the franc less attractive, and again, it's usually a safe haven asset. And if holding it costs more money, then why would you hold it? It's that simple. Now, in, in, excuse me, in an even further effort to dissuade investors from buying the currency, the SNB said it would lower its target range for the three-month LIBOR rate from the existing range of minus 0.75% to 0.25% to a new range between minus 1.25% to minus 0.25%. It's a lot of percentages. I hope you all got it. Now, the SMB will also charge banks 0.75% on deposits that exceed a certain excess reserve threshold. Now, these policy changes, they come one week before the European Central Bank is expected to unveil a massive bond buying program, which might have forced the SMB to intervene repeatedly in order to defend its franc euro cap. The Swiss National Bank justified the policy changes in a statement saying, quote, in these circumstances, we have to conclude that enforcing and maintaining the minimum exchange rate for the Swiss franc against the euro is no longer justified. People on social media have dubbed this franc again. Seems a little dramatic to me, but you know, with more than 40% of Swiss exports going to the eurozone, a strong franc it's just a nightmare for leading exporters. Swiss shares tumbled over 10% Thursday, putting them on track for their biggest one-day drop in the last 25 years and wiping out about 100 billion Swiss francs off the main index. Bottom line, my trip to Davos next week just got a whole lot more expensive. To get his take on oil, I sat down with Rick Rule, chairman of Sprott USA Holdings. Now, in this segment, I first asked Rick what happens to capital investment in the energy sector when oil prices are this low. Take a look at what he had to say. Capital is going to become much more expensive. Um, the very cheap debt that the industry has uh, been allowed to gorge on, both in terms of the junk markets and in terms of the conventional credit facilities, uh, is in the process of drying up now. Uh, evergreen revolving credit facilities are going to be termed, which is a different way of saying that there isn't going to be more credit available to the industry. The declining share prices are going to raise the cost of equity capital. At the same time that operating margins, uh, X hedges, are going to, in many cases, decline by 75%. This is an industry that has for 10 years gorged on cheap capital, and that competitive advantage has come to a screeching halt. And what about OPEC? You know, Qatar has recently said that it won't cut production even at $40 a barrel. So isn't that bearish for oil? It is. 
Uh, one of the interesting things that Americans have to face is that uh, for 10 years or for 15 years, we have, many of us at least, uh, the big thinkers, have suggested that the uh, Arabs were in some way, shape, or form responsible for higher oil prices. The truth is that during the period of high oil prices, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and the Emiratis invested tens of billions of dollars to increase their productive capacity. And it was, in fact, those very heavy investments in the face of production declines from places like Mexico, Venezuela, Indo uh, Indonesia, Peru, and Ecuador that allowed us to constrain the upside in oil prices in the $110 to $115 range. In fact, the Arabs became our best friends. And the Arabs are now swing producers. They, I think, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but I would suggest that they didn't want to give up market share to protect a $100 a barrel pricing umbrella to let less efficient producers, like the Iranians, uh, and frankly, like the U.S. shale producers, enjoy that pricing uh, umbrella and strand 50 or $60 billion in capital that they had put in place to increase their own productive capacity. Rick, Spain's Repsol is buying Talisman Energy for $13 billion. Now, that's Canada's fifth largest independent oil producer. And we already saw Baker Hughes and Halliburton getting together in the oil services sector. So are we likely to see more consolidation as the oil prices uh, turns down? I certainly hope so. Um, the consolidation is useful in many ways. First of all, the industry lead, needs to lower its general and administrative cost as a percentage of production and as a percentage of revenue. And hopefully these consolidations will eliminate most of one management team, which is a good thing. The second thing is that making uh, capital allocation decisions across a broader asset base can and should lead to better uh, investment decisions uh, against more different competing uh, uh, you know, sort of projects. And the third thing is that traditionally larger entities have enjoyed lower costs of capital. And lowering the cost of capital as a percentage of total revenues is, very, is, is also a very important thing. So I would suggest that these amalgamations are very good for the industry. And I don't think that they're anti competitive. The uh, oil and gas energy, the oil and gas business and the service businesses are extraordinarily large businesses and extraordinarily fragmented businesses. And I think an awful lot more consolidation can take place before anti competitive pressures as a consequence of size begin to kick in. How much institutional memory is there in places like back in in North Dakota where shale is getting tapped? Uh, and I ask this because they are new to the oil boom where producers in Texas have seen several boom bust cycles. Well, I think institutional memory, un unfortunately, is very short. Uh, and I think that occurs for a few reasons. I if you're speaking in particular about investment institutions, uh, many of the institutional managers uh, run other people's money as opposed to their own. And they're fee chasers, which means that they sort of flit from hot cycle to hot cycle. But the industry's memory is very short, too. Uh, one's expectation of the future, unfortunately, is set by one's experience in the immediate past. And if your experience in the immediate past, going back four or five years, has been good, you tend to become more aggressive. It's a natural human tendency, one that I unfortunately have fallen prey to a couple times myself, to confuse a bull market with brains. And $100 oil leads uh, some people in the oil business and also some of the institutional analysts to confuse the bull market engendered by high energy prices with their own acumen. Uh, we're beginning to see that come apart now. That was Rick Rule, chairman of Sprott Holdings. Time now for a very quick break, but stick around because when we return, Peter Schiff will be on the show. Peter joined me earlier to talk about the whole currency tsunami that the Swiss Central Bank has created. That's the Swatch creator's words, not mine, tsunami. And you definitely don't want to miss Peter's thoughts on this very fiery topic. And in today's big deal, Edward Harris and I are talking about what this whole Swiss currency spectacle means for the Federal Reserve. And as always, don't forget, you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube, youtube.com slash boombustrt, and also on Hulu at hulu.com slash boom dash bust. Now, as we go to break here, or look at some of your closing numbers of the bell. Come on back with us.
here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Really? The only show I go out of my way to watch every week. It really packs a punch. Ow! Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. They do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the world bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. So you visit the doctor for a routine checkup, and he tells you that you need immediate surgery. But I've been healthy my whole life, you say. No, he says, you must be feeling pain. And you say, but I don't feel any pain. Let's get you prepped, but scalpel, please. And you don't say a thing. You just take it. It's the same with news. You can just sit back and take that first opinion, or you can get a second opinion. Snow is coming down sometimes at two inches per hour. The city is buried in six feet of snow. It's so cold there, you can actually throw hot water in the air and it turns to snow. You can actually see how quickly it came down. An entire year's worth of snow in just days. Today on RT America News, another chilly day in Washington as President Obama and congressional leaders square off once again. To get his take on Switzerland, I was joined earlier by Peter Schiff, CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. Now Thursday, the Swiss National Bank abandoned its commitment to maintaining the artificial prop to the euro franc exchange rate, causing the euro to collapse by well over 20% at one point. Now I first asked Peter what he made of this move. Here's what he had to say. Well, first of all, it's not just the euro that collapsed. The U.S. dollar collapsed almost as much. Uh, but I think it was the right thing to do. I think it was a mistake for the Swiss to have adopted that peg in the first place. And in fact, by abandoning the peg, they're admitting it was a mistake because now the Swiss franc has appreciated anyway, which was something that the, the, uh, the peg was designed to prevent. But now the Swiss National Bank has tens of billions of francs worth of losses on a 500 billion plus uh, cash of uh, euros and dollars that they've accumulated to defend that ridiculous peg. But of course, had they not end it, ended it, the losses would have mounted. I mean, if Europe launches QE, they could have lost true hundreds of billions uh, uh, of francs. It's true. And you know, the, the, the Swiss bank, they put it slightly differently than you. They say that they abandoned this because it was no longer necessary. I, and I guess it's no longer necessary because they had no other options when your back's against the wall. It's obviously yeah. no longer necessary. Central bankers rarely admit their mistakes. <laughs> but what's changed? I mean, it's not necessary because it didn't work. It was never necessary. They probably have a much greater supply now of euros and dollars on their balance sheet than they bargained for. And the prospect of having to, you know, back up the toboggans and fill them full of euros was very daunting. And, and so they, they abandoned this peg. And, uh, you know, thankfully for the Swiss, we have a lot of investments in Switzerland. And so our clients also benefit uh, from the strength of the Swiss franc. But Swiss people are going to benefit. Look at the drop in oil prices now in terms of Swiss francs. Prices are going to come down, and the Swiss are going to be that much more prosperous because of a stronger franc. Well, now, here's the question. Obviously, they, uh, they, they got rid of the cap that they had to the euro, but they also went into negative interest rates, so, you know, lending overnight and et cetera. So how will that affect your clients? Yeah, well, I mean, we mainly own Swiss, Swiss equities, and we do okay. have some Swiss debt, so we don't have Swiss bank deposits, so we're not going to be paying uh, any rate of interest to, to hold our Swiss francs. But I, look, I, I think that is a mistake. I don't think they need negative interest rates. I think that is, you know, taking some of the, the, the luster off of the franc. It would be even stronger had they not done that. But, you know, a, a strong currency is not a bad thing. A weak currency is a bad thing. So Switzerland should take pride in the strength of its currency. Now they have to deal with the losses by trying to prevent it from rising. And of course, there have been some economic mistakes made in Switzerland and elsewhere because of this monetary policy that now have to be corrected. And so, unfortunately, these were needless mistakes that didn't have to be made. But, you know, I think a lot of people are now jumping to the conclusion that 
Europe is going to do a big QE program, and that's why the Swiss are backing away. You know, without the Swiss, I think it makes it that much more difficult for Europe to do QE. So maybe they're not going to be able to do it because they no longer have the Swiss uh, uh, to uh, support their currency. Maybe they'll do some more substantive economic reforms instead. That would be a positive for Europe. I think that it could mean that the U.S. is the last uh, central bank standing with QE, because I think we're going to be doing QE4. Now, uh, I'm glad that you bring up that you said before that a strong currency is what you want, not a weak currency. But, you know, according to MIT, 47 percent of Swiss exports go to Europe and 36 percent goes to the top eight Eurozone destinations. So Switzerland is actually a huge exporting nation with a large account surplus. So isn't that a concern? No, because it just means that the Swiss are going to be able to get a better deal on all the products that they import from Europe and from other countries, and so they won't have to export as much to pay for their imports. So that's positive for the Swiss. I would be worried about the Europeans who are now going to have to spend more money buying Swiss products. They're the ones that hurt, as are Americans. Now, Swiss products are going to be more expensive for Americans, but American products, whatever those products may be, are going to be cheaper for the Swiss. So the Swiss win because they have a stronger currency, and Europeans and Americans lose because we have a weaker currency. Keep it simple. I like it. Now, you know, Simon Kennedy of Bloomberg says forward guidance may need to be increasingly taken with a pinch of salt. And it seems like the credibility of not just the Swiss National Bank, but central banks more generally are in tatters. So what are your thoughts there? Well, I think that uh, you're going to see a complete breakdown in the confidence people have in central banking over the next several years. I mean, number one, right, the Swiss were saying that, you know, over my dead body, right, they were saying we will defend this peg to eternity, right? And then they went around and they, they didn't do it. And of course, that's generally what central banks do, right? They have to deny, deny right up until the point where they do what they were denying they were going to do. But I think you have a lot of confidence and trust and faith in central bankers. And I think that bubble in central bank confidence is going to burst. It's going to be shattered, particularly when it comes to the confidence people have in the Federal Reserve and in Janet Yellen because they've been talking about how great the U.S. economy is. Well, anyone who's actually been paying attention to the statistics, this, this uh, mirage of a recovery, this illusion is fading fast. And I think instead of the promised recovery that, that Janet Yellen has been talking about, we're going to have a, a, a relapse to recession. And instead of rate hikes, we're going to have QE4. And that's going to be the end of, uh, of their credibility. Peter, former Fed Governor Jeremy Stein told uh, John Hilsengrath of the Wall Street Journal today that he would hike rates in June if he were still at the Fed. But does this massive move in the Frank put pressure on the Fed not to hike rates um, in order to basically tamp down on monetary policy divergence? Well, they should have raised rates a long time ago. But the reason they didn't was because it would have pricked the bubble and it would have exposed all the problems that the Fed helped create. Uh, and so that's why they're not going to raise rates. They're going to come up with an excuse. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll be the foreign exchange markets. Maybe it will be energy. Maybe it will just be the weather. Or maybe it'll just be because the sky is blue. But it doesn't matter. But they're going to have an excuse as to why they can't raise interest rates. But the one thing they can't do is tell the truth about why they're not raising interest rates, because it's impossible to do that without precipitating a worse financial crisis than the one we had in 2008. So instead, instead they're going to continue to pursue this policy until we have a dollar crisis. Now, clearly, this is a big move in the ongoing currency war. So where do we go from here, Peter? Well, you know, the Swiss just surrendered in the currency war, and, and that means the Swiss people win. Uh, and I think more countries are going to surrender. And, you know, the Swiss economy is going to improve because of this. And maybe that the myth will die about the fact that you need a weak currency and that somehow you're punished. The Swiss are going to benefit from a reduction in their cost of living. They're going to see an increase in their standard of living. Real Swiss GDP is going to be stronger with a stronger franc, not weaker. And so maybe more countries will throw in the towel and surrender in the currency war. And unfortunately, I think America is going to win the currency war. And that's a race to the bottom. And when you win the currency war, that means your citizens lose. Now, Peter, you, uh, you kind of gave us your thoughts on this before, but I want to ask you point blank and ask you seriously, do you now think that the ECB doesn't do QE from here? What do you think? Well, I've never thought that they were going to do 
a full-blown QE program the way the markets are anticipating. And I still think that that's the case. Uh, I think if they do something, it will be much less than people are hoping for. And of course, what they're hoping for is destructive policy. Europe will not benefit from QE. See, people think QE helps you. It didn't help Japan. Japanese economy is in worse shape now because they did all this QE. There are people who think QE helped America, but it didn't. All QE did was exacerbate all the problems it was supposed to solve. And now those problems are bigger than ever. But you don't feel how bad they are until you stop doing the QE, and then you know the hangover sets in. That was Peter Schiff, CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. Time now for today's big deal. Currency wars, oh, currency wars. That's what we're going to be talking about today, Ed, right? It's like yes. Jim Rickards produced the show, if you will. <laughs> All right. Um, so, anyway, stuff going on. Swiss National Bank, it's a very big deal for sure. So, can you break it down for me what happened today and uh, what this means for the markets, particularly? Yeah, so let me break it down in terms of how historic it is. Uh, basically, when you look at uh, inter or, uh, exchange rates, they've been floating for about 45 years now. And so basically, of all the uh, you know, major currencies, this is probably the biggest one-day move that we've ever seen in a major cross uh, since Bretton Woods uh, was reformed in uh, That's kind of amazing. 1971. Yeah, of right. a major currency, we have to say that too. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you might see some minor currencies, you know. Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe. Might have exactly. Had some issues, I was, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but when we're talking about major currencies, the euro, uh, the formerly the Deutschmark or the Gilder or whatever it right. may be, plus the, the dollar, uh, the pound. And also the Swiss franc. This is the biggest move that you're ever going to see. Uh, you know, wow. from my perspective, this is the sort of thing that is on, commensurate with uh, when the UK was exited from the ERM, the exchange rate mechanism, mm -hmm. in 1992. Everyone remembers that because George Soros was betting against the pound, and they that got was a big, uh, yeah, they, they got that was turned the breakup out of, that. of Soros and Rogers too. Exactly. They, they, had, they went separate ways then. That was a big. Big, big deal. So I want to ask you, you know, is this just another salvo um, in the currency wars? It definitely is. I mean, because basically what's happened is the Swiss have capitulated. They've said that, you know, mm -hmm. you guys, you're the big dogs, you ECB, you Fed, you guys are too much for us. We, we can't handle it. Because basically they were pegged to the euro and the they believe that the euro is going to uh, continue to depreciate against the dollar. And that's going to put a lot of safe haven sort of influx into the franc. And to keep the franc from appreciating, which they didn't want because uh, they wanted to continue to export, uh, they had to intervene. And so their balance sheet was bloating up massively. Either they had to mimic what the ECB was doing or they just had to capitulate. And so they capitulated. So what do you expect the ECB to do on January 22nd? That's the big question. Yeah, I, I think that the ECB, what's going to happen is, is they are going to go QE. And uh, so I think that it will... Schiff might disagree with you. A, a little <laughs> bit, yeah. <laughs> I think that, it, you know, really they have no choice at the end of the day because their they policy to, options yeah. are limited. They're, they have no fiscal policy options available to them. They want to make sure that uh, they shore up all of the individual government debts uh, that they have, especially in Spain and in Italy. They don't want to see any sort of contagion that causes, a, a, you know, a divergence of, yeah. of, of rates between Germany and the periphery. So they've decided that this is the only way forward. And so they basically just they have, they to, have to do it. There's a lot on their plate. They got to they got to make sure they're they're covering it all. But the big question is, what other currencies to watch? What's the next one? Yeah. So I mean, from my perspective, when you look at other uh, currencies, I think the first one that comes to mind for me is the Danish krona, because oh. the Danish krona uh, is the Danes actually they had a chance to go into the euro, but they rejected it in referendum. And so they opted to go into uh, what's called ERM2, which is the exchange rate mechanism uh, that people, that countries that are going to join the euro are in. So they can join at any time if they fulfill all the criteria. So they're in this, this huh. box. And they only ha let okay. their, uh, their currency uh, fluctuate like 1% from the euro. Uh, and now they've hit the floor 
uh, where basically uh, if their uh, currency appreciates any more, the last time it went to this level, they had to install negative interest rates. Hmm. So I think that they're in, tr in jeopardy of breaking through that floor, and they may be forced to, uh, to go to negative interest rates just like the Swiss have done. And Ed, you know, what about the Fed? Isn't it the Fed's kind of tightening that's caused all this policy divergence? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at all the other central banks, I mean, even the Bank of England now has sort of backed away from tightening. Uh, all of the, the countries that were tightening at some point are now uh, loosening. So everyone's on easy street except for the Fed, which has a tightening bias, says that they're probably going to raise interest rates at some point this year. So that means that to the degree that you want any sort of policy adjustment. Everyone else is easy, only the Fed is being, relatively speaking, more, uh, less accommodative. And so they're the only ones, that's the only game in town. The strong yeah. dollar, I mean, it's re responsible for oil prices to a certain degree, it's responsible for commodity prices to a certain degree, and also now currency. So the strong dollar is a huge problem. But you, you said the Fed, they raise rates in June, right? So mm -hmm. do they? Yeah, well, that, that's the question. I think that a lot of people are backing away. If you look at sort of the weighted average of, you know, what economists are saying is going to happen, it used to be like 35% of economists were saying June, just like I'm saying. What about but, the money? Uh, Where's the smart money? Is it backing away? But, yeah, everyone's backing away. And you can see the, uh, the, the rates saying uh, further and further out, you know. Okay. More people are saying September or even later, et cetera. And the reason is is that the, the number of problems with raising rates have started to compound. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have the Swiss uh, National Bank thing. You also have the fact that the yield curve in the United States yes. is getting crushed. I mean, it's flattening like crazy. Uh, out to one year, if you look at a 12-month treasury, it's only yielding like 15 basis points. If the Fed were to hike, the yield curve would, would invert, and normally that's seen as a sign of, uh, of weakness, as if the economy yeah. is about to go into a tailspin. So uh, that's not what they want to be doing. Ed, we're running out of time. I wanted to ask you, you have oil, then you have copper, then you have stocks. Now you have this drama. What's going on? Ten seconds. Lots of volatility. I there think you that go. You're going to get more volatility. <laughs> more volatility. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Concise. Thank you so much, Ed. That's all for now. But we love hearing from you. So do please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash boombustrt. And please also tweet at us at Aaron Aid, at Edward NH. From all of us here at Boombust, thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.